Positives, I greet you with a warm handshake and a happy heart. My name is Nikki Petrie. I'm the Acting Executive Director at the Center for Native American Youth, and welcome to Webinar Wednesdays. We are so proud to connect with you virtually and build community with one another. And thank you for joining us today. In honor of Health Awareness Month, our focus today is going to be on mental health and caring for our medicine, or as we say in Coeur d'Alene, caring for our Sumesh. I invite you to join in the conversation, comment, ask questions. Be sure to tune into the conversation in the future. Have wonderful afternoons. Take care of one another and take care of yourself. Liam Lynch and Jess Boos. I'm a role member of the Blackfeet tribe, and I'm very um, honored to be here with these young change makers that we got going on here. We're discussing today mental health, and, and it's really critical for our nations that we talk about mental health in the realm of COVID. As tribes, we have historically been aware and been uh, victims and subjugated to pandemics. And so this is an old story for us. And through this old story, we're having old historical trauma reactions. And that's to be expected. Our ancestors went through this and now we are going through this. And we are trying to get through it the best way we can. So we have to develop our resources. Our ancestors weren't allowed to mourn. They weren't allowed to complete the cycles. Oftentimes when things happen, because of governmental policy. Today, we're not under that office. We're not under that mandate. And today, collectively, we try and get through one of the most um, impactful, mental impactful um, events in our life. We have to remember that our ancestors sustained many of these things. Our ancestors sustained many losses. So today, we struggle when we look at our, our relatives, many, especially our, our, our relatives at Navajo Nation who have lost 100 people. That's the first time. So in that spirit, we come forward today as innovators, as supporters, but most importantly, as Native folks who are really engaged and embedded and supportive and really want mental health for our community and for ourselves. So I honor these young uh, ladies here. They are awesome. They're uh, leaders at the Center for Native American Youth and have been selected and went through a rigorous process to be a, uh, a leadership, leadership model and role model. So at this time, I'm going to start with Jasmine and ask her to introduce herself. Uh, Hello everyone, my name is Jasmine Wildcat. I'm an enrolled member of the Northern Rapo tribe. Uh, I'm, I just turned 17. Um, I live in Riverton, Wyoming, and I am a 2020 uh, Champions for Change. Okay, Micah? Carlos, uh, good day, everybody. My name is Micah Carlos. I come from the Salt River P. Maricopa Indian community in Arizona. Uh, I serve on the Youth Advisory Board for the Center for Native American Youth, and I currently work uh, for my tribe doing substance abuse prevention for youth. Okay, Shavana. Underwood, Hinch Good day. My name is Shavana Underwood. I come from the Quinault people. I am the vice chair of the Quinault Culture Committee. I am the secretary of the Quinault Canoe Society. Um, I'm a student at Evergreen State College and I'm the administrative assistant to our behavioral health program. So chemical dependency and mental health. And um, that's what I'm currently doing. Well, thank you. So welcome ladies. And, and if the uh, general public has any questions, please 
type in and we'd be well we'd be so uh, honored to be uh, have you included as a part of the discussion so with that you know i'm going to start with jasmine and ask um jasmine you know jasmine you're recognized as one of our 2020 champions for change it's quite an honor congratulations and what is your platform around mental health to bring broader awareness to mental health so um, my my platform is bringing awareness to uh, like the commonality of uh, mental illnesses and uh, the possibility of utilizing alternative uh, coping mechanisms. So after being diagnosed with um, anxiety and depression in uh, 2019, uh, my activism helped me get through uh, tough times. Uh, I have started the Ni'ini Ni'ini project and Ni'ini Ni'ini means good things um, in uh, the Northern Apo language. So um, that project uh, will help those with uh, depression and anxiety get involved in activism as a form of uh, coping. So by initiating the conversation, I hope to do my part in uh, destigmatizing mental illness and uh, by offering an alternative uh, coping mechanism so um, others uh, will find their own inner strength and passion to make a change in the world. How has your alternative coping mechanism, Jasmine, helped you in this time of stress and, and really psychological distress with the COVID? So with everything going on right now, um, you know, I can't really use my, like, a, uh, you know, my one, uh, I guess, activism type of thing. You know, you can still do stuff uh, through social media and things. But uh, right now, I'm currently just um, personally, I, I'm just doing stuff to you know, make me stay busy um, here at home. Uh, like, you know, I just recently watched all of the Star Wars or I've been uh, doing yard work with all my family and, uh, you know, spending time with uh, all of our pets. And uh, that's that's how I'm, you know, yeah. doing uh, <laughs> coping uh, during these times. Great. So as a person who has a precondition of depression and anxiety, has the COVID environment um, in, increased those symptoms for you at all? Um, personally, I would say yes, because, you know, despite how much I want to say, uh, you know, I'm like a hardcore introvert, um, you know, I, I realize that I need, I really need that social interaction with, uh, with people, <laughs> sort of like people other than like my family that I live with. Um, you know, that's, uh, I, I would say that it has sort of increased, but, you know, I've been taking, um, you know, my um, medication and everything. So I, you know, I'm still not as, you know, like on the downhill, but um, I've gotten better. So, so, so medication is key, keeping up with your medication, staying connected. Um, it sounds like you stick to kind of a schedule of events and try and help as much as possible. Those are all very helpful for you with your already um, conditions of depression and anxiety. Would that be a good assumption? Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> okay. And then Jasmine, um, you mentioned something that I think is so critical for our native youth is some of them are going to miss their um, commencement exercises. And these are really um, times that we honor and, and our native people, we honor to to the max, huh? How, can you tell me how that's um, impacting your overall mental health to not be able to do the commencement services this year? Well, I guess it doesn't really affect me. Uh, I just, I'm a junior in high school, so I, oh, I don't graduate until next year. But I know on my older sister, who's a, a senior in college, and she's, you know, she's graduating with, uh, you know, three bachelor's degrees, and she was looking forward to walking across the stage and, you know, them naming off all three of her degrees. And uh, I know it's it's pretty tough on her, but, you know, I guess one step at a time and uh, just we'll just get through it. And, you know, there will be other big uh, opportunities to get recognition in the future. Okay. All right. So we'll go on. Thank you. We'll go on to uh, Micah. Micah, you want to introduce yourself? Um, like I said, I am uh, Micah Carlos. I come from the Salt River P. Maricopa Indian community. And there I work as a project coordinator facilitating a grant focused on substance abuse prevention for youth. 
Um, so a lot of my job focuses on um, not just doing substance abuse prevention, but also how can we equip people in our community um, to focus more on their health overall. And of course that includes mental health. Um, so that's also a big part of my job. So Micah, I know that you're a, a big uh, force out there in Indian country and sit on a lot of committees, committees and do a lot of work, um, including substance, uh, substance abuse and mental health. So can you tell us a little bit, can you share with us and share with our people about the ways you see the intersection of mental health and substance abuse and dependency and, and what you're seeing in your community? Yeah, so um, coming into this job, I I thought my my focus was going to be on just substance abuse prevention. You know, growing up, we had the D.A.R.E. program, um, doing programs like that. And it wasn't until I got started and I realized how many different programs I would need to collaborate with. And um, I saw Darina's on here and she works with our Family Advocacy Center. And one thing we did is we teamed up with them and we started um, talking circles. And so they're really just a safe place for the people in our community to come and share um, the struggles they're going through. It also can be a, a way to come together and just share some positives that are happening in their life. But for a lot of people, um, that step of going to, whether it be therapy or counseling, that's a big step for them. And um, they've, a lot of them are in recovery. And that's kind of what we, we've seen is that people who are coming to these talking circles um, are in some kind of step or journey. Um, they're still in their journey of recovery. And so um, it's really important that we focus on their mental health and that's kind of what the talking circles does. Um, it gives them a place to come and check themselves and um, you know, a few people in the community have shared that this is their form of therapy. And I think that's kind of, it speaks to culturally, this is how we are as people. We, we might not um, go to a therapist, but we'll come together as a community to support each other and to make sure and check in on each other's mental health. So um, that's been a big part of it is just realizing that people um, who might have struggled with their mental health, a lot of times they self-medicate with um, different substances, whether that be alcohol or any kind of other drugs. But that's just their way of coping with a lot of that, the pain that they're feeling. And when I speak to the youth, that's kind of the conversations that we have is that they, they're they realizing that a lot of the people, adults in their lives, um, have experienced a lot of trauma. And um, we've also as a community have been taking steps forward on um, what is trauma. We wanna be a trauma informed community from the top to the bottom, including all of our government departments. And so um, we recognize, we have to recognize what is trauma? How do we prevent furthering trauma? And then what do we put in place so that we can break the cycles? And a lot of it is getting, especially the youth um, to realize that trauma doesn't have to be included in part of our lives and that we can break this cycle, that trauma doesn't have to exist. And um, by working on our mental health and getting resources in place and um, seeking counseling, that we can create this different environment for our people um, where we might not have, where we don't have to use substances in order to um, deal with that pain of the trauma. And so that's a really big part of it. And I think when people start to realize that, um, People don't wake up one day and decide that they're going to have an addiction. Um, they, a lot of times, they've been trying to cope through various other ways, and the point of um, that pain is too great, and they need something to numb it or something to take their mind off of it to escape, and that's where they turn to substances. And so, I think when more people realize that um, people don't choose to be substance users, um, that we can try to change that that conversation around it and focus more on getting people resources rather than um, judging them for choices. Yeah, how are, you, how are you continuing that practice today with giving social distancing and sheltering in place? How are you continuing that practice for your, your tribe now? So I've, um, we're doing a lot of focus on trying to get Zoom stuff, stuff started. Um, I saw that you know, there's some friends on my Facebook who have been really adamant about um, leading others in their their journey to recovery, as we call it in the community. Um, they've been hosting like 
AA meetings on Zoom, um, recovery meetings on Zoom, um, just making sure that the people know that there's someone that's there to listen to them. Um, and as we've all experienced, you know, we're trying to get creative with um, social distancing and trying to keep in ch touch with each other. And a lot of uh, is that is happening over the internet, whether it be Facebook groups, uh, Zoom meetings. Um, and we're seeing that even we're having to take the steps to um, keep the culture going through Zoom. You know, it's not the preferred method, but it is um, one of the resources that we have and we don't foresee this COVID situation lasting forever, but um, using the internet and social media is a really good temporary resource for keeping each other connected. Do you want to talk? I know we talked beforehand, but uh, you did a wonderful thing with the uh, drumming and singing on Zoom. Would you please um, share with us about that? Because it's such a wonderful resource. It's a cultural resource. And I just think it's just great. Yeah. So um, as I was sharing that, um, my and it's not just me. It's really, like I said, a lot of departments have come together um, focusing on how do we help the community? And we here in Salt River have there was an idea to do Zoom week. And so there would be different sessions hosted um, specifically on Zoom or Facebook Live. And the very first session was we brought, or we had two people, um, an Autumn singer and a Pipash singer come. And they talked a little bit about how they got started um, singing, who they learned from, the etiquette, and just answering questions from the community uh, about um, you know, how do people get started? Breaking up a lot of the myths are, is this only a male? Um, is this something only males can do, which it's not? And um, just kind of talking and sharing songs with the people. And I think that that's really helpful for us because it kind of breaks that barrier of people often being afraid to um, pursue the culture because they're, they're not, they don't know it. Um, they were never introduced to it. And so they're, um, a lot of times it's embarrassment or they're shy, um, but we want, the whole purpose of it was getting people from the community to um, just pinpoint somebody who does it so they can reach out to them. And then a, um, another session we had was with our higher education department. And so they talked with, um, you know, as junior high all the way up to people who were um, pursuing their undergraduate degrees. They talked about what they needed to do for to get into the program, how to maintain their progress in the program, um, what they as parents should be looking for and preparing their kids for. And then we have our sessions today and they're actually three different sessions focused on mental health, um, junior high to 11th grade, talking about the changes that are happening, specifically a session for seniors in high school, talking about that kind of loss, that grief of not being able to um, celebrate their accomplishments with their families in a big group. And then also um, for parents, uh, you know, this is a really difficult time. They've now had to assume the role of parent, teacher, full-time worker. And so um, they're going to be talking with our behavioral health services and answering any questions they have. And then our last session is actually going to be on financial literacy. Wow, these are all wonderful pieces of services. I just want to um, just recommend and, and just really support what you're doing around culture. Culture is the resource that collectively we as Native people, we have to heal collectively. And that's why COVID is such a strain on what we do because we're used to our ceremonies, our bundle ceremonies, our singings, our, our pipe ceremonies. All those things are bringing the people together for the wellness of our tribes. And we can't do that. And so it's very, very stressful. It's, it's very, very difficult. But to think of other ways to do it through social media, Micah, is just phenomenal. And, and it's not the optimal, but it's something. Because as Native people, we heal together. We don't heal over here in our house or over here in our house. We heal together. We're a collective people. So thank you for that work that you're doing for Indian people in Indian country. Shivana, I'm going to go to Ch Shivana has been a great person. I've seen a video where she's out feeding, um, bringing food to elderly, and she's done some um, uh, some wonderful things. What are some, the Quinault Nation is closed down and it's, and the borders are closed and 
to lessen COVID. So what do you think, um, why don't you, Shavana, tell us a little bit about yourself and what are some of your other responses and efforts that you guys are doing and that you're doing as a tribal member in your community for mental health? Okay. Um, so I'm Shavana. For people who are just getting on, my name is Shavana Underwood. I am the vice chairman of our culture committee, the secretary of our Canoe Society. Um, I go to Evergreen State College. I am the administrative assistant to behavioral health, so chemical and de chemical dependency and behavior mental health. And I'm also a 2020 champion for change. And um, some of the things that the Kona Indian Nation has done to help protect their people, um, like Dr. Kip said, was to um, close our borders. So um, we don't allow people who aren't local to the community or who aren't essential. So like we have our doctors that come into the clinic every day that aren't community members, but they are. So um, people who have to travel in and out are welcome and our beaches are private. So they aren't, um, they aren't American, they're Quinault. So we have our right to close our beaches. And um, so those are some of the bigger things that we're doing. Um, to protect our people um, on a smaller scale. Health and wellness is delivering food during the week to elders, so cooked meals and making sure that no one is without food. We also deliver, um, well, we hand out fresh produce from our gardens and um, we have fishing, clam digging, like all of our treaty rights that are still open because you can practice those with social distancing. Um, so we're still able to um, live in a quinilth way um, but um, when it comes to the essential shopping and leaving the Quinault Nation, um, we try, we encourage people not to. And um, we give out stipends to elders to shop locally so that they don't have to leave. And um, we just recently started testing COVID at our clinic. So I'm only there Tuesday through Thursday for mental health. Then they're testing um, individuals for COVID and we still have zero cases. So for now, what we're doing is working. And um, we're really grateful and we're keep trying to keep it at zero. Uh -huh. So what do you see um, Shavana as the mental health responses that you guys are doing, maybe either culturally or that aren't um, of mainstream society that's very helpful to the Quinault nation? Yeah, um, so for mental health, we are doing individual sessions with our counselors. So we started Zoom. Um, a couple of weeks ago. We actually use a different company, but it's similar to Zoom and um, clients check in and whoever wants to, um, when it comes to if they're harmed to themselves or others, um, we do go see them in person while practicing, practicing social distancing. Um, and recently we started um, putting together like prayer bundles. So our traditional medicines to the Quinault Indian Nation. So like cedar, the different kinds of oils that we use um, to help with anxiety and depression symptoms because a lot of people are very anxious right now um, in quarantine. So we offer that and it's a traditional way to connect with um, like who you are as an indigenous person and you don't have to use western medicine if you don't want to if that's not what works for you. Um, so we offer um, our traditional medicine. That is so wonderful. The prayer bundle is something that's rich in your culture and widely recognizable for people to have something tangible to feel mm -hmm. safe and to grab on it. I know every morning when my husband smudges, I, I grab the sweetgrass um, bundle and, and smell it and then I can feel better. I can feel safe. So that uh, mm -hmm. is just such a wonderful um, intervention for mental health. Okay. Mm -hmm. So all of you have done some pretty phenomenal things. And, and I'm going to throw this question out to anyone is what advice, um, what lessons have you learned just about yourself given the challenging time of COVID? I know we've spent a lot of time uh, reflecting and deciding and praying and, and conceptualizing, but, you know, through this, through this, I think we learn a lot about who we are as individuals, who we are as tribal people, who we are as people who are invested in the wellness of Indian country. So how, what have you learned about yourself? I'll go. <laughs> um, Jasmine, thank you. 
So, so as I said before, um, talking about, you know, or I guess me personally, uh, talking about how, how I actually like would need, I need like, you know, social interaction um, because, you know, things get lonely and you just, you just need, you know, the, the hierarchy of needs, you know, you need, you need to have social interaction and you need to have, you know, like you know, that, that care for you and everything. Um, and then another thing that I've learned, um, you know, something I've already know, I've already known, um, is uh, the the privilege that I have and how how blessed I am to be in the shoes that I'm in, because I know that um, there are many people you know on our reservation that are struggling or uh, many of the youth who uh, don't come from the same home that I do. You know, I have you know two two parents and um, you know we're we're pretty stable and everything. So I just you know want to acknowledge that and you know that's what I've learned at that you know, that there's others who don't have the, the blessings that I have. That's such a, such a, a wonderful learning for someone so young. Thank you. Anybody else want to share how um, COVID has affected them and what they've done, what you've learned about yourself? Yeah, so I'll go ahead and um, answer that. Um, for myself, it was really a big um, life change. I had been um, for my job and you know other various I hold. I had been on travel um, at least a couple of days every month for about ten months straight, and so um, I was <laughs> scheduled to be on travel for about fourteen months. And of course, now everything's been canceled. And for me, um, I'm used to life on the go, and I'm always traveling and I'm always busy, and I. I like it that way. I like to stay busy. I like, you know, working in 12 hour days because I get to spend time with the kids after my job ends. Um, but I think for me, that slowdown and that having to um, come to a halt really just made me realize that um, I need to prioritize my own health and um, my mental health is included in that. You know, I really struggled. I was used to. Um, spending time with friends and family. And um, for me, kind of just having to really work at making sure that I'm keeping those connections and um, the value that I place on um, to see my family and being able to spend time with my grandpa. And because I was always on the go, you know, he had, he had mentioned to me that he, he was sad he didn't see me as much. And now, you know, distancing, I, I get to see a little bit more. We talk on the phone pretty frequently now. And that's been really good for me. And I really had to work on my gratitude, uh, reframing my my uh, my mindset, reframing that, you know, this isn't a punishment. I'm not stuck at home. I'm, I'm um, blessed to have a home to be safe in. Um, you know, <laughs> I'm not tired every day I'm thankful that I have food to cook and that I have the resources to provide for myself um, I, you know not that I miss my friends that I'm, I'm thankful that my friends are safe where they're at and so for me that's a big part of it is having to reframe my mindset and um, having to express my gratitude I have a friend and um, we were pretty frequently you know we ask each other what's what's the highlight of the day what's the silver lining for today um, so that we can share our gratitude with each other, but also it helps us check in with each other. And um, that's really something that I would like to um, keep going in even after COVID's over, but just kind of making, finding that silver lining of every day for myself. So gratitude is extremely important to you. Yes. Yeah. Aisha Vaughn, you want to tell us what you found out about yourself during this very stressful time? Um, I, I haven't really, I just really miss clients. <laughs> I miss seeing everybody face to face. Um, so that's been a really difficult change, but I can't imagine how difficult it is for them. Um, so I, I don't know. I just miss the way my job used to be and, um, having it change so much has, uh, made me really tired. And that's kind of the only way I can describe how I feel lately is just really tired and my work takes more of my energy than it used to. Um, so a lot of self-care. Um, 
I just spend a lot of time by myself and I, I live on the beach. So I just leave my window open and listen to the ocean all night. And um, those are things that I had to do so that I can be a better professional and keep together because <laughs> um, we're the ones that are supposed to, you know, take care of other people. But it's been harder to take care of myself is what I learned right now. Um, and I, I try to take care of that before I come into the office. I leave it at the door. And um, getting to do work like this definitely refills my cup too. Um, getting to hear um, your strengths and what you're doing um, is really helpful. So it sounds like Shavana, the key for you is that connection to the ocean and to to nature. And I think that's one thing, um, Micah and Jasmine and Shavana, that's key. When you live on the reservation, you have that connection. It's readily accessible to walk out in the forest to, or to walk to places that our grandparents, our grandfathers walked. And, and so that is key because it keeps us in that grounded, grounded place. But I also think that, you know, one of the things in Shavana, you, you mentioned it, is that there's something called the COVID camp, is that we've been in this kind of realm of mundane and um, non-sensory place, you know, that we're, we're not used to. And so with that comes a lot of feelings and a lot of reactions and a lot of thoughts. And some of it's like, I just can't do this anymore. And so sometimes we shut down by sleeping or being depressed. And we hope that that's um, not uh, not ongoing, but it's symptomatic of what we're going mm -hmm. through. So um, given all this, given all this, someday, someday we hope to come out. And someday we hope to be non-COVID, but it doesn't sound like it's going to be for a while. What do you see as, as we transition from a very traumatic event like the pandemic? And this pandemic is especially traumatic for tribes because we've seen this before. We know this through the history of our people. We know this through the history that the memories that are carried genetically and through the stories of our ancestors. So we know this. But now we're, what do you see as one of the biggest mental health concerns or behaviors or, or things that are going to be on the forefront as we come out of COVID? What do you see as the needs there once we get past this? Like, it's not like we're gonna wake up one day and we're gonna all feel perfect again. We're not because we've been in this for um, quite a while now. And so our behaviors and our thoughts have been reinforced for this length of time. So it's almost like we're going to have to reprogram, huh? Coming out. I often think of it like you're in the dark and you're coming out and you have no sunglasses on and the sun hurts you, you know. Coming back out of COVID, it's going to be a huge challenge. So do you have you had any thoughts or what do you think will be the challenges moving forward? I would say um, I have thought about this and I think it's really hard to kind of pinpoint um, specifically like what concerns I have for my own people, but I know that uh, it comes down to grief um, and whether that's, you know, grief over losing a job, loss of um, being able to participate in ceremonies, whether it be graduation or even traditional ceremonies. Um, and then just grief in general, we are still losing people and it's not, not due to COVID, but just, you know, people pass away. And um, for my own family, you know, we lost one of my grandmas during the, and having to um, send her off into the next world without being able to practice those traditional customs that we're, we're used to or being able to gather and uh, striking that. You know, as we um, as we we held her her burial, you know, there were signs put up um, from the tribe trying to keep people safe. But one of the the lines up there say, um, "No handshaking, no hugging." And for us, that's <laughs> culturally that's that's um, it's well to not pay your respects, um, to not try to comfort your family members that are hurting. Uh, and so I think people have a lot of are going to come out of this with a lot of unresolved, unresolved grief. Um, 
And it really it could just be, you know, loss, that feeling of loss of even just the regular way of life, the old way of life. We're going to be coming into a new normal. And I think people um, are not going to know how to handle that. And, you know, people lashing out um, with anger. And um, I think really that's going to be, my, that's my concern is that people are going to be having a lot of grief and um, how do we get ahead of that? How do we try to um, handle these situations before they become something else? You know, we don't want people to turn to substances to um, numb that pain that they're going through from the grief. And so that's my my concerns and what I'm, you know, especially for our youth because they their life is disrupted. Uh, they're, they're, spent, they're experiencing a lot of these feelings that um, they might not know how to process and maybe they don't have somebody with them who can help them process. Um, and so working with youth, that's kind of my concern of how do I, uh, we're allowed to come back together. How do I start to address these problems and how do we as a community start to address these problems? I think that's um, so on point, Micah, that after this, after COVID, grief is going to be a major issue because you're right, our, our people have lost much during this time and our youth have lost their right to celebrations and, and those who have uh, overcome um, some obstacles celebrating those and then the, the loss of our people. And, and as Native people, we have to do ceremonies and we have to do certain things during that time and we're, we're denied that right now. And so I think you're right on task there, Micah, when you say there's going to be an overwhelming amount of grief that you'll have to try and develop some kind of program or ceremony around that. How about, how about you two ladies? What do you, what do you think will be the issues coming out of COVID? Well, um, I, I completely agree with uh, with Micah, you know, because uh, you're just just in my county here in Wyoming, um, we have at least uh, or we have at least um, 182 uh, tested cases and majority of those are here on the reservation. And yeah, for sure, the grief is going to be a huge issue. But I guess just looking at uh, the positive, once we all come out of here, uh, you know, all out of uh, social distancing and all of like the uh, everything. Um, coming together, you know, finally, it, it won't be all at once, uh, of course, you know, but finally being able to, you know, spend time with your extended family, because I know that a lot of uh, my strength and my family strength comes from, you know, spending time uh, with, uh, you know, my cousins, um, you know, my grandma, especially, um, you know, I think just being able to uh, get that exposure to um, other people who are going through the same uh, issues that we are currently um, will, I think, help everyone um, feel better in mm -hmm. a sense. That's great. That's true. Thank you, Jasmine. Um, Shavana, what do you think are going to be the major issues for the Quinault tribe as we come out of uh, COVID, the major mental health? And what do you propose that might be helpful? That is a good question. Um, I think one of the hardest things for everybody is not being able to connect with um, what they consider their culture. So for me, we can't potlatch and we can't have our songs and we, those things you don't do uh, over video, our songs, we're not allowed to do that. So we um, feel like it's kind of been taken away from us. So I think that's gonna be one of the hardest things um, easing back into. Um, coming together as a community, because like we can't have funerals, we can't um, celebrate. And so that's something that people are taking really hard. So I think we're planning to have a potlatch um, because one of our biggest ceremonies was canceled. And um, that was supposed to be in Canada this year. And um, so we're planning on healing. So I think that's just something that we're looking forward to is the healing aspect of coming getting through this because we can't get over it but we can get through it and so we're looking forward to that healing aspect and getting to hear the songs getting to see our elders and speaking our language to each other and that's going to be the best part 
Um, I see we had a question on there and I'm going to paraphrase it, but um, there was a young person saying she lived in an urban area and doesn't have access to ceremonies and things. Can you all provide some kind of way that people can get relief from pain and isolation when they don't have access to their normal ways to heal through um, their tribal ways or access to their tribal medicine people? Can you all help them uh, by providing some ways that could be um, soothing and comforting for them? Maybe one thing that you do or something like that. Oh, you're all, um, I would, I would suggest, um, you know, reaching out, I guess that I think that would be the best way to, you know, to people that are, um, you know, in your tribe or just, I guess your local, uh, indigenous people as well, because I know that, um, you know, I have some cousins who live in uh, Colorado who aren't really as close, um, with their uh, native ties, um, you know, and I know that they sort of struggle, um, but I think that would be the, the best way is just reaching out, getting that exposure. And, uh, you know, eventually uh, when all this is over, maybe you can even try like traveling to, um, you know, where you're originally from and all of that. And uh, especially um, us, I would say that we would have to be a, a good role model, um, you know, and get all of that out there to, you know, to help uh, spread um, our ways and everything. Oh, that's wonderful. Mike or Shavana, you want to help a, somebody out that might be struggling and trying to get well? I think for myself, when um, when I'm kind of feeling like I'm struggling, I just go outside, you know, take in some deep breaths and work on uh, my breathing, but also taking in that fresh air. Um, I think for a lot of us, we're we're just stuck inside and we kind of just think that this is how we have to be. We have to be inside all of the time. Um, we're able to, you know, get out in nature and just uh, feel the ground, just kind of stop and, you know, don't, for me, out to the river, I don't, a lot of times music, I just sit and listen to the sounds of like the birds or the water, um, just everything around me and just kind of take it in and, I just let that speak to me and let it calm me and let it clear my mind. And so for me, that's, that's what I do. Um, if you're not able to do that, you know, it's just practice um, that mindful breathing and, um, you know, making lists of, of gratitude. What are you, what are you thinking for? Um, trying to reframe your, your mind, you know, instead of being annoyed with something you can, how do you flip it? Instead of being, like I said, instead of being mad that I'm stuck inside, well, I'm thankful that I have a roof over my head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Shavana? I think I would say, um, I say this a lot, that your culture is your identity, and no one can take that away from you, even if you're far away from home. And that's something that I learned when I travel. I feel so homesick for the ocean. I miss the ocean at night. And so I pray about it and I leave those feelings in creator's hands. And I pray that I'll get to go home soon safely and I'll get to carry knowledge and um, learn more from my elders. So look forward to learning and um, you'll never stop learning about your culture. I feel like I'm a baby still and I was raised in my culture. So um, just look forward to learning more and no one can take it away from you. Wow, all these are great strategies for any youth listening out there to understand what are the things that you can do to get in balance and to feel safe. And I see where somebody posted on, on the chat to focus on the medicine wheel. That's a gift to native people from creator. And some of them look different, but it's all about the mental, spiritual, emotional, and physical. And so if we do one thing in every day, in the medicine wheel, and we're going to focus on that, then that will um, support our health and wellness as we move forward. If there is any, um, and this is for the team, for my uh, Native scholars here, if there are any young people out there who are really struggling today and feel that, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to get help because People will think I'm I'm weak, or people will think that they'll they'll say I'm crazy or things like that. 
what would you tell them today in order to help them to move forward and remove the stigma? And I know, Jasmine, this is your big thing, removing the stigma of, of seeking help in mental health. Um, I would... I would say to, um, you know, anyone struggling is that everything happens for a reason, you know, um, that is, that is a big thing that I, I, I like to tell people because it, it's true, you know, you, you never know, um, you're, you're just going to grow from uh, all the hardships that you go through. And it's just, I, I just say that's just it pretty much, um, you know, there will be hard, hard things in life and, you know, big hurdles, but uh, like like Shivana said, you we will get through things. Yeah. Any other of you, uh, Micah and Shivana, what would you say to a youth who's struggling right now with mental health issues and and feeling that they want to get help? I think um, for a lot of us, there's there's always that stigma. I know growing up, um, you know, was always kind of seen as um, bad, but I think. Um, when we look at health and mental health is included in this, we kind of have to have that understanding that, you know, if we're sick, we go to a doctor or we go to a medicine person. And it's, you know, if I, um, if I have a cough, I'll go get that treated. And it's the same thing, you know, uh, your, your mental health, you're, you're ill, that way you go get that treated. It's not something you just leave alone. Um, for me, and that's kind of, Something that I really struggled with, you know, in my journey of um, counseling and therapy is kind of being able to accept that um, this isn't something to be ashamed of, um, and that it's it's part of making sure that I'm okay and that, you know, uh, um, I'm here for my family. And if I choose to have a family of my own one day, I don't want to burden my children with uh, resolved traumas. And so... I think that's really kind of one thing that we have to focus on is that we're doing this for ourselves and it needs to be for ourselves. You can't be going, you can't uh, seek out counseling to fix other people. It's something that you have to focus on and that you want to fix yourself. Um, I think that's really kind of understanding it and uh, substance, you know, working in the substance use field, um, working with people, there's a lot of stigma around that as well. And, um, of what we talk with the youth about is changing the language that we use to um, describe people who use substances instead of saying uh, we call them junkies we don't say they're not clean we say well that's a person who uses substances um, person who drinks that's a person um, you know we make it uh, person first language because they are a person and I think that's really what we have to change you know when we talk about mental health we don't say um, I noticed that I started calling my calling myself out on. Um, we don't call things crazy. We don't say um, we don't call people crazy. We don't use language like that. Because um, really, we want we don't want we don't know what anybody else is going through, and we don't want to shame them into not seeking help. Mm -hmm. Shivana, to a young person, I would say I always feel like I'm like an anti-role. So I would say that you are beautiful and you are deserving of healing. It takes an incredible amount of courage to ask for help. So I hope you see that as a strength and something you can do, something you're capable of doing and no one is there to judge you for it. And that you're beautiful is what I would say and that you are more than enough. And I, I do hope people reach out and um, value their mental health because we all have mental health. Mm, thank you, Shivana. And that's such a, a powerful message. I just really am so honored, so honored to be with the youth. You know, I um, am a clinical psychologist, but I had my own journey with mental health and with substance abuse. And, and I'm a little bit older than you, or maybe a lot older than you. And I have struggled. And as I reflect, and as I see what is happening today, is that everything is given to us from creator. And even trials around mental health, even trials around COVID, even trials around isolation, there's a lesson for us to learn from Creator. So today I ask Creator, like every day, what lesson do I need to know? But I also give thanks because I've been in substance abuse. I've been in mental health and still, you know, back and forth. And 
and I give thanks for him because in each each disease, each illness, each each adventure, each pathway, Creator has chosen that for us, and He chose that for us so that we can help others, just like you ladies are doing today. I, I'm sure that you've reached out and touched many, many people. And in Indian country, where we're so isolated today, and to have this collective wave, you know, we see how popular the social distancing powwow is. We see how popular when the girls show the blushes and they turn into their Indian clothes. We see how popular and how that makes our heart rise and be enlightened. Today, you have all taken the risk to enlighten our people nationally. And I pray for you in your communities. I pray for strength for each and every one of us. And I thank you all for being leaders for the Center for Native American Youth. We are just so honored that you have decided to take on these tasks that Creator has given you and to be a leader and leadership is quite different. So thank you for today. Is there anything that you wanna um, say as we close? Okay. All right, well, well, you know what? I have a little, go ahead, Micah. Well, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you for the opportunity and Center for Native American Youth for um, doing these series. I know this is the first episode of many and, um, it's great that, you know, as I'm not really considered a youth anymore, but um, that other youth are given the opportunity to reach out to hear from their peers about issues that are important to us. And um, so I really just commend Center for Native American Youth for giving us this opportunity. And that's, that's also what I wanted to say. That's also what I wanted to say is that, um, you know, thank you to, you know, to you and to everyone else, and you know, C uh, CNAY, and just this was this is pretty cool. <laughs> Shivana, did you have any closing statements? No, I just want to say thank you as well, and I hope everyone stays safe. Yeah, well, thank you guys all. And so, with that, I, I have a little story, and this was given to me by um, Dr. E.J. Ramos. Um, who's a clinical psychologist, and his mom was from Pap Papanga, and she was born in the jungle during World War II. And I'm just going to read this. It's really quick, but it just really speaks to the culture and how culture helps us. And his mom was born during World War II while her family was hiding from Japanese invaders. Her mom, his mom, died after gift. His grandma died after gifting his mom to the world. His mom told him that his family couldn't cook anything while hiding in the jungle because smoke rises and would give away their location to Japanese soldiers. So they mostly ate a variety of fruits, vegetables, and root. Water was scarce, so many times they had to squeeze water buffalo poop for drinking water. They lived like this, hunkered down, conserving resources, hiding, dodging bullets, looking out for each other and constantly afraid for their lives for a couple of years. Many of his ancestors perished and many survived. And those who perished had undoubtedly left their mark on this world in many ways, just like his grandma. So in a very deep way, they had also survived. Not sure why his mom felt compelled to tell him that story but he was deeply thankful. It is empowering to remember that we came from ancestors who are strong, resourceful, and resilient. I share this story to allow many of you who have ancestors who have survived life and death situations to um, know that they undoubtedly left their legacy on the world, and that is us. So let us remember what our ancestors went through. Let us remember, we are not alone in this. Our ancestors are with us. Their strength and resilience is within us, and their legacies are us. Let's honor them, and just like them, 
know that we will survive and leave our legacies too. You guys have a great day. Thank you so much for being a part of CNAY's first hour. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.